Westbrook Online, Pastor Mon here. I'm so thrilled that you have dialed in uh, to our online service today. We are in a sermon series called the Red Letter Challenge, and we're really excited about this because we're studying uh, specific passages of Scripture and uh, components uh, of how Jesus wants us to live. And we're kind of looking at these uh, passages of Scripture and these components based upon what Bible translators have put in red, letters in red, the red letters. And I really think that you're going to be encouraged uh, by this. Glad that you're here with us today. And we know that you're going to be blessed by by what we want to talk about today. Before we leave this service, however, we want to encourage you to to get connected to us. Uh, Reach out to us via email or one of our social media sites. Let us know that you're watching. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let us know what's going on in your life. We want you to know wherever you live, whether you're here in the United States or wherever you are across the globe, You are not living life alone. We can partner with you. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. As you share your blessings uh, uh, to our ministry, we want to pray for God's blessings upon your life as well. Also, before you close today, uh, make sure that you find some bread and a cup of juice. We'd love for you to take a moment and remember the body, the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We call it communion. And here at Westbrook, we partake of communion every single Sunday. We'd love for you to do that as well. And remember what Jesus has done done for you. Uh, There's so many things happening in the life of our church. You can go online to our website or social media sites, see what's happening. And uh, even from a distance, you can get engaged. We'd love for you to connect with us however you best can. As you do that, we want you to know we're praying for you. In fact, I want to pray right now, and then we're going to go into our time of worship today. Lord, thank you so much that we can come together in this incredible medium uh, called an online worship service. God, I pray that those who are listening, those who are watching, will be encouraged by you today. They'll sense your presence. They'll sense your spirit living in their lives. God, that you'll be with them as they go through and that they'll know, God, that you can make a way when there seems to be no way. God, would you just lead us and guide us and direct us into your will and may we just be led by your spirit. That's our prayer. In Jesus we pray, amen and amen. Well, I pray that you'll enjoy this service today. God bless you. Well, God, we stand today on the firm foundation of Christ. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he never let me down. He's faithful.
we live in an interactive world where new social media challenges pop up all the time. Some for enjoyment, some for a good cause, others are just plain dangerous. What if you tried a new challenge? One that could transform your life, community, and the world. What if you spent 40 days studying Jesus' words and applying his teachings to everyday life? All focused on five principles. Being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going like Christ. So what are you waiting for? Let's join together and take the Red Letter Challenge. Well, good morning, Westbrook Christian Church Online. Uh, My name is Jake Garcia, and I'm the congregational pastor right down the road at Crossroads Christian Church. Now, I have the honor and privilege of being a part of the teaching team here at Westbrook. So uh, from time to time, probably about once per sermon series, uh, I get to be here with you, and this is one of those opportunities. We're currently in the very last week of a five-week series that we've been going through leading up to Easter called the Red Letter Challenge. Now, this isn't a series that's original to us. Uh, As a matter of fact, there's about a thousand other churches who have gone through this exact same sermon series that was created by author and pastor Zach Zinder, uh, because what he wanted churches to do, what he wanted his congregation to do, is focus on five of the key targets that Jesus seemed to focus on throughout his ministry. And so that's what we've been focusing on for these five weeks leading up to Easter, these five targets that Jesus focuses on uh, because he wants us to be like him in every way. We, We wanna, so the five targets are being like Jesus, forgiving like Jesus, and then serving, giving, and going like Jesus. These are the five targets that we as Christians are called to aim for. And so today, I wanna talk about going, going like Jesus. And as I started thinking about the different things that people are willing to get up and go for, the things that people are willing to go to to great lengths to attain, uh, the great lengths that they'll go to uh, to have these new experiences, And I started thinking, you know, we are willing to go after the things that we're passionate about. It doesn't matter what it is for you. Uh, Maybe uh, just recently uh, you found yourself on Ticketmaster waiting in the queue because you desperately wanted to get a hold of some Taylor Swift concert tickets, right? Or maybe uh, you were like my father-in-law a few years back when the Xbox 360 first came out. Uh, There was a line outside of Best Buy, and it snaked around the entire building. There were people in tents. Uh, My father-in-law was one of them. He waited overnight on Black Friday so that he could get his Xbox 360. Now, while I kind of chuckle at that, because that's not my thing, uh, as I was thinking about it, and I was thinking about my own life, I've done the same exact thing. I've been willing to go. I've been willing to step outside of my comfort zone. I've been willing to sacrifice for the things that I care the most about. I remember I was in high school, and back then, music, music didn't come out on Fridays. I I have long been a huge music fan, and back when I was in high school, new music was released on Tuesday, not on Friday, and I loved, it was like a, it, it was borderline a religious experience for me. Every Tuesday, I would go to this record store in Crest Hill called Crow's Nest. Now, it's not there anymore, and every time I drive past Once Upon a Child, my heart breaks a little bit because I miss the old record store that was there. Uh, but I remember going to that record store for a midnight release of an album. Now, if you know me, you know that I usually am not even up past like nine o'clock at night. I, I'm... I'm an old man, I have an old soul, I like to be into bed early, right? And so for me to be up at midnight to get a CD said something about what I was passionate about. Everyone has something that they're passionate about, that they're willing to go for, whether you're passionate about sneakers and you're a sneakerhead, or food and you're a foodie, or uh, fashion and you're a fashionista, or video games and you're a gamer, whatever it is that you're into, you're willing to go to great lengths to attain it, to experience it, and to share it. 
kind of reminds me of what Zach Zinder says. He says uh, about this idea of going like Jesus and doing the things that Jesus did. He says, you can't be a follower of Jesus and stay still. It's this idea that if we're following Jesus, it is going to be an active pursuit. Jesus invites us to follow me. He doesn't invite us to follow, to, to understand him completely. He says, follow me. He doesn't say, understand me, uh, understand every aspect of who I am. He says, follow me, which brings us to our big idea. Our big idea for today is this. We may never understand him perfectly, but Jesus invites us into a relationship where we trust him completely. We may never understand him perfectly, but Jesus invites us into a relationship where we trust him completely. If we are going to go the way that Jesus does, we need to trust him completely. How do we do this? Well, I think Jesus laid it out pretty well for us. He says, follow me. That, that's the call. Uh, his ministries are, are bookend by this call. Uh, at the start of his ministry, he says, come, follow me. He invites the disciples to be like him. His ministry starts with the call to follow me. And his ministry ends with the commission to go and do likewise. His ministry is bookended by the call and the commission these are the things that are most important to Jesus. It's about going and doing and being more like him in every area of our life. But it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen by accident. I remember when I was in Bible college, I was, uh, I was in school to be um, an intercultural studies major. I was a missions major because they didn't have church planting, uh, I didn't have a church planting degree at my school. Uh, and so I remember learning about all these different missionaries. And there was one particular missionary that really stood out to me. Uh, his name was Bill Borden. Uh, and in 1904, uh, William Borden graduated from uh, from a, a Chicago high school, and he was an heir to his family's fortune. And as someone who was already incredibly wealthy, uh, his family gave him as a graduation gift a trip around the world, a, a trip to a, a year long trip to experience the whole world. And so, as the young man traveled through Asia, through the Middle East, and through Europe, he felt this growing burden for God's hurting people. And so he wrote back to his friends and family that he wanted to be a missionary. And there were some people in his life, uh, uh, particularly one close friend of his, that expressed some concern, that wrote back to him that they thought that he was throwing his life away as a missionary. That's an actual quote that was written to him from a so-called friend, that he was throwing his life away. And shortly after... He got the response from his friends. Uh, legend has it that he took his Bible and in the front of his Bible wrote these three phrases. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Now what we learn is that eventually uh, Bill gives his life on the mission field uh, doing exactly what he wanted to do, sharing the good news with as many people as possible. And while some looked at Bill and said, oh, you're throwing your life away, uh, Bill said, no, 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 I am doing something so much more and I'm going to live with no regrets, no reserves, and no retreats. That was so inspirational to me that as a college kid, I actually wrote a similar phrase in the front of my Bible. I, I wrote a little note to myself. I said, Jake, there is no plan B. We, the church, me, you, all of us, we are God's plan A. There is no plan B. When he left the Great Commission to us, he was entrusting us with his legacy, with his mission 
to go and share the good news with as many people as possible. And so many times we want to overcomplicate it, but there are no burning bushes and neon signs. Sometimes I wish that God would talk to me like that through a burning bush or through a neon sign, but sometimes it just looks like a regular old obedience. Even when we don't understand his plan perfectly, we are still called to go to go and share the good news with as many people as possible. So, if you have your Bibles, uh, what I wanna do today is something a little bit different. Uh, We are gonna be looking at the end of each of the four Gospels uh, and looking at the words of Jesus. The whole idea behind this series, the Red Letter Challenge, is in many of our modern American Bibles, the words of Jesus are uh, indicated with red letters. So we're calling this, uh, this series the Red Letter Challenge because we're looking at the words of Jesus. What does Jesus say about these things? So I want to share with you uh, some counterintuitive advice. So if you're anything like me, uh, at some point you were probably taught to drive, right? And your parents took you out or your grandparents or an aunt or an uncle, uh, and they probably taught you that green means go, right? And that red means Stop. Now, this is where things get a little wonky for me uh, because the advice that my dad gave me was not correct. Uh, What my dad told me was that green means go, red means stop, but yellow, yellow, yellow means go faster. He told me that the yellow light was the go faster light. And here's the thing, I believed him. It wasn't until I was in driver's ed that I realized I was wrong. They asked me, what does the yellow light mean? I said, it means go faster. Everyone got a good chuckle, but I realized in that moment, my dad was not telling the truth. And what my experience was, when I was in the car with my dad, the yellow light would come, he would drive faster. I was in the car with my mom, the yellow yellow light would come on, she would go faster. And Everyone I saw, probably some of you as well, when the yellow light came on, you would go faster. So I believed that yellow meant go faster. I learned later that it actually means yield or slow down. So just like my dad gave me some unconventional advice all those years ago, I want to give you some unconventional advice that goes against what we might typically think. Typically, we say green means go and red means stop, but today I want to flip that on its head because today as we look at the words of Jesus, what we're going to see is that red means go. Uh, If you don't remember anything else as we go through this message today, I want you to remember that red means go. At the end of every one of the Gospels, Jesus reiterates the importance of going and sharing the good news with as many people as possible. So first, uh, Matthew 28, if you have your Bibles, I would love if you'd turn in your Bibles to Matthew 28. I want to look at verses 19 and following. This is after Jesus has uh, lived his life. He's uh, performed miracles. He's preached powerful sermons, and he was betrayed by his friends by the power of God after being hung on the cross. Three days later, he comes back out of the grave, and these are the very last words of Jesus to his followers. This is known as the Great Commission. He says this, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always until the very end of the age. The reason I love this is because Jesus is reminding us here that that God is in the business of using broken people. God is in the business of using the unlikely to do the impossible. God uses the B team. Remember, back then, uh, only the best of the best got to be a rabbi. Only the best of the best got to follow a, a well-known and respected teacher. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So when Jesus calls these disciples who are, are fishermen and tax collectors, these are the guys who were not the best of the best. They didn't make the cut. They weren't the ones who had memorized all of the Old Testament. They went, to, they went back to their family's trade But what I love about this is that after all this is said and done, we're reminded that God God leaves the ball in our court. 
Now, he uses us, everyday, ordinary, average people. And what he tells us is, he says, go and make disciples. In the Great Commission, we see three things, right? Go and make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey, right? So he says, go and make disciples. A disciple is just someone who follows Jesus, right? So I say it like this. Uh, He says, go and live in a way that makes other people wanna follow me. Once they wanna follow me, then baptize them. Once they've been baptized, then that's when sanctification comes in. Sanctification is just a big fancy church word of becoming more like Jesus over a long period of time. He says, then I will teach them to obey everything I have commanded and surely I am with you always. Jesus is trying to encourage us. He's trying to encourage us that as we go, we will face difficulty, but God will be with us. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Uh, Mark So the four gospels of Jesus are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, And so they're all the story of Jesus, but it's told from four different perspectives. I kind of say, imagine you're watching a movie and you know, four people go and watch the same movie and then someone else asks them about it. They're gonna talk about some of the main things, but the details that each person highlights are gonna be a little different. So I wanna look at the end of Mark, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Uh, It says this, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So what we see is at the end of Matthew, Jesus says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of Mark, what we see is a very similar message. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel, the the good news that Jesus came to save us from our sins to all of creation. Now this is where me as an animal lover, uh, I love this. Because it doesn't doesn't just say uh, preach the gospel to your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors. Uh, He doesn't say that. Because as a kid, I was that type of kid that when the teacher gave us rules or instructions, I was the one that always wanted to raise my hand. And I had a question uh, about a loophole. I was always looking for a loophole. Uh, I wanted to know where the line was because I was gonna walk all the way up to the edge of the line. Uh, I, I was one of those kids that pushed the limits. And I think Mark, Mark was probably a little bit like that, which is why I think he says what he says. He says, there's gonna be no excuses. He says, preach the good news to all of creation. Men, women, young, old, white, black. It doesn't matter what color. It doesn't matter what age. It doesn't matter what gender. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even matter if they're human. Preach the good news to all of creation. Preach the good news to dogs, cats, chickens, birds, and everything in between. Me as an animal lover, I just heard that's an excuse to go preach the good news to my chickens. Uh, I do have chickens. Uh, But I love this because we see this passion for sharing the good news with everyone everywhere. So I know typically green means go, but what we're seeing at the end of each of the gospels, when we're looking at the words of Jesus, the red letters, what we're seeing is that actually red means go. So the third passage I want us to turn to is Luke, uh, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 45 through 49 is what I wanna look at. This is the very end of the gospel of Luke. Uh, this is what it says. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay here, stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So in Matthew, he tells us, 
to go. And he promises that he's gonna be with us. In Mark, he says, go and preach the good news to all of creation, men, women, uh, young, old, cats, dogs, and everything in between. But then I love in Luke, uh, Dr. Luke wants us to, to understand it a little bit better. And, and what we see at the end of Luke is we see a glimpse of the bigger picture. He reminds them that this is exactly what has been promised. All of the Old Testament leading up to this has all been pointing to Jesus. All of the prophets, all of the kings, all of the poems, all of these things were leading up to Jesus. And Jesus says, the Messiah that you have been waiting for, I am him. And I will be beaten and I will be put in a grave, but three days later, I will conquer the grave. I, I love that what Luke is doing is combining the, the, what, the promises of the Old Testament, and he's joining them with the promises of the New Testament. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament are all pointing to Jesus and the repentance and forgiveness that we can only get from him. This is why going is so important. We are called to go just like Jesus. We're called to go and share the good news with everyone. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, the fourth and final gospel is John. Now we're not gonna be quite at the very last chapter of John. We're gonna be in the second to last chapter. I wanna look at John chapter 20, verse 21. John chapter 20, uh, verse 21 says this. Again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. Now, in John chapter 20, he says this phrase on three different occasions. Peace be with you. This is something he wants his disciples, he wants us to understand. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Uh, Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. He says, just as the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. We are sent by Jesus to share the gospel. We are sent by Jesus to join what he's doing. I think one of the most powerful things we can do as individuals and as Christians is to share the story of Jesus. Share the story of Jesus with our life, with our words, our actions, and our attitudes. So if you would flip one more page, uh, John 21. Now this is not in red letters, uh, because these are not the words of Jesus. Uh, These are actually the words of John talking about Jesus. But this has always been a passage that has encouraged me. John 21, verse 25 says this. It says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. I, I love that idea that, that somehow, some way, Jesus is doing so much in the world, not just then, but even now, that if, if if a story were to be written about all that God has done in my life and in your life and every individual's life, there would be more, uh, there wouldn't be enough room in the world for all the books that would be written about what God has done in your life, in my life, and in the lives of all the people that we read about through scriptures and through all of history. The biggest impact we can have is by joining the story of Jesus and sharing our story, uh, filling our world with God's story, uh, filling our world with the good news of what God is doing in and through each and every one of us. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we look at all four of these gospels and every one of them, we see the same repeated message to go. He's going, he's sending. It's this reoccurring theme that red means go. I know typically we say that green means go, but as we wrap up this series, I want you to remember that red means go. When Jesus speaks, he's always going to encourage us to go to everyone everywhere. There's one final passage. If you're writing these down, I I would love for you to go back and read these later. But the fourth and final passage is from Acts chapter one, verse eight. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those are the four gospels of Jesus, the four stories of Jesus, right? And so the way I kind of think about it is if we're looking at the end of these four gospels, 
And at the end of each of the four gospels, Jesus says, go, I'm sending you. Uh, I think about the book of Acts. Acts is short for the Acts of the Apostles. This is what the disciples did in response to being told to go. The book of Acts is them going and spreading the good news to everyone everywhere. Look what Acts chapter one, verse eight says. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, my representatives, my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He's saying, look, it's gonna start with you. It needs to start with you, but then it needs to spread to your friends and family to your coworkers, to your neighbors, right? To, to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. But that's only gonna happen if we get out of our comfort zone. Now, one thing that I think is pretty interesting uh, is throughout the Bible, we see that the Holy Spirit is referred to as the great comforter. The Holy Spirit is known as our, our great comforter. And, and sometimes as a pastor, I'll have people ask me questions like, you know, I've been baptized, I've been going to church, I've been reading my Bible, but I just don't feel the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. I just don't feel the Spirit of God. I, I don't feel the Holy Spirit working and moving in my life. And I often come back to this idea that he's the great comforter. And I think, when do we need to be comforted? Well, typically, we need to be comforted when we're uncomfortable, right? We need to be comforted when we've stepped outside of our comfort zone. But too many Christians are not feeling the great comforter because they're remaining comfortable. They're not getting out of their comfort zone. They're not willing to experience. They're not going. They're not doing the very thing that Jesus told them to do. He never said it was going to be easy. He never said it would be convenient. He never said it would be comfortable. But he did tell us to go, and he promised us that when we went, he would give us the Holy Spirit to be with us always. So maybe, if you're not feeling the Holy Spirit, if you're not feeling the presence of the great comforter, maybe it's because you spent too long in your comfort zone, and maybe it's time that we get out of our comfort zone and go out and start sharing the good news with our friends, our family, and our coworkers. It's not gonna happen overnight, and it's not gonna happen by accident. Uh, I've said this before. I love when I find things in history and science and sociology that point back to ideas that we read about in scripture. Not too long ago, I read a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. And in that book, he talks about this, the 10,000 hours principle, uh, that people are, don't become a master of their craft until they've put in 10,000 hours of practice. And a after reading that book, I, I got to thinking, like, is that what happened with the disciples? Uh, not only did they get the Holy Spirit, but they had been following Jesus day in, day out. They'd been following so closely to him, doing the very things that he did. Uh, is it possible that they became master disciples? They became masters of their craft because they had put in their 10,000 hours? So then I started doing some, some math, and this is where I think it's pr pretty interesting. When you look at the typical Jewish work day, uh, it was from sunup to sundown. So it was about 10 to 12 hours every single day, and they worked six days a week, and they took the Sabbath off, and there was a handful of holidays and festivals where they wouldn't work or do anything like that. And so if you were to take and do the math over the ministry of Jesus, at 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, uh, multiplied by three years. Anyone wanna guess about how many hours the disciples had been following Jesus when Jesus went back to heaven and left them with the Great Commission? Yeah, if you do the math, it's right about 10,000 hours. And I, I just think that's incredible that some of the things that we see in the Bible still hold true today. Here's why I tell you that. It doesn't happen by accident and it doesn't happen overnight. He doesn't expect us to understand him completely or perfectly, but he does call us to trust him completely. So what about you? Are you ready to accept the call? Well, every week as we wrap up, I try to highlight one of the four markers of a healthy disciple. And today I want to highlight action. Now for everyone online, uh, I, I know 
I know that you're not here in person, but we would love to follow up with you. If today is the day that you've decided to, to accept Jesus, to accept the call to follow him, we'd love to follow up with you. We'd love to pray with you. Or maybe you've already accepted that call and the next step for you, the next action step for you in this process of going and being more like Jesus, maybe the next step for you is to be baptized. Or maybe you've already been baptized. Maybe you've already put your faith in Jesus. But maybe, maybe you need to repent. Maybe you just have some things going on in your life. You, you love God. You know that you love God. You've been, you've been following him for a long time. But maybe the next action step for you is to repent, to turn away from some of those things and be reminded of just why Jesus loves you, why he went to the cross so you could be forgiven. I don't know where you are on your journey, but I know that he calls all of us to go, to be like him, to love, serve, and share the same way he did. My hope is that you would go and be like Jesus. And remember this counterintuitive advice that red means go. Please pray with me. God, I wanna say thanks again for the opportunity that we have to come together uh, to open your word, to be challenged, encouraged, and inspired to live for you. It is my hope and prayer that we would take these things to heart, we would apply them to our life, and we would do our best job of living for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From the far side of the chasm, you had me in your side. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, free my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved Inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days But then you walked right out again And now death